What's up guys? Hi and welcome to Uncle Scott's Pancast episode 15. In today's episode we're going to talk a little bit about shrinkflation. Got an update there. We're going to talk some carbon steel skillets, some Martha Stewart Dutch ovens, get some poll results about watermelon and more. Let's get started. Okay first up you may notice that I appear to be a little green around the gills. I don't sound quite as eloquent as normal. That is because I have a raging cold. What happened was I sent my little son to Mother's Morning Out, which is kind of a sexist term these days. I'm a dad, I enjoy Mother's Morning Out too, right? I'm outraged. Anyway, two hours at Mother's Morning Out Three days later, the little guy's got 104 fever. Good Lord. Got that down. Five or six days later, he's finally feeling pretty good. Around day five, old dad here started getting a little headache, a little scratchy throat. I came down with it. I'm now on day eight. Day eight. So you send your kid to school for two hours. We're now total about day 13 of abject misery. They say you send your kids to preschool they get exposed to all these bugs and stuff early on. It builds up their immune system. They don't get them later on in life. I disagree. I went to preschool as a kid. I got sick. Later in life, I'm still getting the same preschool colds. Anyway, today is the first day in about eight that I can string together two or three sentences without going into a coughing fit. As a matter of fact, I haven't felt this bad since the last time my wife made fish taco. Okay, shrinkflation. We're going to start out today talking about shrinkflation. In the last episode, we showed how shrinkflation was occurring in Costco paper towels. You get fewer paper towels per roll, even though the cost per roll to the consumer is still the same. Well, this week we want to take a look at what's actually in some of the packages, some consumer packaged goods. I'm going to start out here with some Life Cereal. One of my favorites from my childhood, Life Cereal, still going strong. Open that up, take the package out. And actually, this was a pleasant surprise. I thought that the amount of Life Cereal in the Life box was very nice, right there up to the top. So they get a thumbs up. Now let's take a look at the kernel. Had movie night the other night, made a big old vat of popcorn. I like some of these seasoned salts, and I opened a new one up, and I was shocked to see what was in there. So thankfully, my wife had bought several of these. Let's open another one here in real time. And... Oh Lord, that is pretty darn bad. Using a marker here, I'm gonna make a line where the contents come up to. And when it comes to this kernel seasonings, you're paying for a lot of air. That gets a thumb down. And I think we know why the kernel is smiling. He just sold us a lot of air. About 20% of my diet is Triscuits. Let's see how they do. And while the Triscuits aren't all the way up to the top, it's kind of in that range, kind of in that margin of screwing that you kind of expect and are used to. So I'm not going to complain too much, but I'm going to give them a thumb sideways. Now, I know the first thing somebody's going to say here is that these things settle during shipping. And as a matter of fact, right here on the old Triscuit box, it says, this package is sold by weight, not by volume. If it does not appear full when opened, it is because contents have settled during shipping and handling. Okay, fair enough. And I think we, uh, we've all come to expect some of that. I think uh, the problem is when it kind of gets out of whack. You can't tell me that in this modern day and age, these things are made on production lines. They can't shake the boxes. They can't shake the containers and make them settle a little bit at the factory, run them back through and fill them back up. I'm a little bit skeptical. And just for fun, what if Triscuits came packaged the same way as saltines, for example? Here I've got a sleeve of saltines. Let's open this box of Triscuits, stack them all up nicely and neatly. It turns out an entire box of Triscuits is equal to about a sleeve and a half of saltines. If they sorted and stacked and packaged Triscuits the same way they do saltines, maybe we wouldn't have to worry about that settling during shipping. Maybe you could get a lot more in the box. Just saying. Martha Stewart, Dutch ovens. Now Martha Stewart kind of gets around. 
She was originally with Kmart for a while. She was with Macy's for a while. She's been in the occasional federal correctional facility. And now she seems to be at Sam's. At Sam's the other day, I noticed these Martha Stewart Dutch ovens. Seven quarters, so that's a pretty good size, for less than $40. So that seems like a pretty good deal to me. Now I do have a Martha Stewart Dutch oven. I asked for a Lake Crusade. My wife got me a Martha Stewart. I said, well, I was hoping for the Lake Crusade. She said, I was hoping to marry Brad Pitt. What? Regardless, the Martha Stewart Dutch oven that I have has been fine. I've been using it for over a year. The lid fits well. No cracks have developed. And I think they're pretty decent quality. My one hesitation with them is that they are made in Asia. They're made in China. So you got to take a little bit of leap of faith. You got to have a little bit of trust that everything is okay in the manufacturing process. When it comes to Le Creuset, any of these other French pans that we talk about around here, I know that in France there are environmental rules, there's a social safety net, there are manufacturing processes. I don't know exactly what they are, but I'm pretty confident that they are there. And I'm pretty sure that the workers are not being horribly mistreated. When things come in from Asia, I'm just not sure. And it's not just with the Martha Stewart enamel Dutch ovens. There's lots of different brands that are made in China these days. I know even the lodges. Most of the lodge cast iron is made in America. The enamel cast iron Dutch ovens made in China. And if you read the packaging, they say that they take tests to make sure that there's no lead in the enamel that is used for their Dutch ovens. Now, on the one hand, that's reassuring that they test to make sure there's none in there. On the other hand, maybe there is some mistrust behind the scenes. Why do you even need to check in the first place? Who would do that? I don't know. So perhaps misplaced safety concerns aside, I think the Martha Stewart's, as far as quality and functionality and look, I've been pretty happy with mine. Now, the one they have at Sam seems to be a little bit different. This one is a, uh, some sort of collector's edition they had when they were at Macy's. The handles look a little different on the ones from Sam's, but still $39, $40 for a seven quart decent Dutch oven, I think is a pretty good deal. Check those out, as long as you don't mind any Asian manufacturing concern. <laughs> Sneak peek, what is coming up next at Uncle Scott's Kitchen? This, this is a Debouille 14 and a quarter inch oval roasting pan. Assuming I don't die from this cold. <coughs> Assuming I don't die from this cold, look for that review feature sometime next week. Now let's talk a little bit carbon steel. This past week I put up that big in-depth review and cooking feature on this made in pan. 10 inch made in carbon steel. I gave it a slight thumbs down. I did not prefer this pan. And the reason, in a nutshell, is that it's a thinner pan, it's two millimeters thick, and with that thinness of the metal, I found it very difficult to bring the pan to the correct temperature. It would either overshoot or undershoot, and then it was also tough to maintain it there without doing a lot of fiddling with the thermostat on the stoves. So anyway, I did not care for the pan that much. I got a lot of feedback under that review, though. Well over 200 comments. Most of them positive, but not all. I do want to highlight a few of those here. Um, Hamilton Lewis, presumably not related to the Formula One driver, said he purchased the Made in Pan about six weeks ago and has had similar results to what I showed in the video. Um, he says he has a gas range, used it for vegetables, pork, red meat, and eggs, and everything sticks. He's tried every way to clean it and reseason it, and it still sticks. So he is not happy with it. He agreed with the review. Um, Pathorn Thongham wrote in and said it was the best pan review ever. Thank you very much. William Bolliard says, your review is about perfect. He's had the 10 inch made in pan for six months. It's okay for a few things all the time, but it has many quirks that keep it from being a go-to pan. I pretty much agree with that. And I like it when a lot of people who watch the reviews also own the, own the pan themselves. So the people that have actually tried the pan they seem to mostly agree with the reviews. That makes me feel pretty good about that. And I did get one comment where someone mentioned that lots of people enjoy lighter, thinner pans. That is true. I probably should have called that out in the review. 
I have mentioned that before in that carbon steel, which pan to buy guide and some of the other thinner pans I've reviewed, particularly that Maviel pan. Now, it is true, some people do enjoy the thinner pans. I got an email from one person who said he and his wife were getting up in their late 70s. His wife loved cooking in cast iron all her life. Now it's getting too heavy and hurt her wrists. Would a lighter, thinner carbon steel work? Yeah, for somebody like that, absolutely a thinner pan is the way to go. You're just going to have to micromanage the temperature much more so than with a heavier pan. But now let's take a look at some poll results. You know, it's summer here in Utah. We had our first 100 degree day the other day. Definitely cold watermelon season. Now I grew up down south when we'd eat watermelon down south. I always put salt on my watermelon. People out here, sometimes they think I'm crazy. So I put that up as a poll question. Do you salt your watermelon? About 400 people have responded so far. And although it's close, there's a slight plurality, although not a majority, who said that they do not salt their watermelon. 38% to 33%. I am in the 33% who salts. Okay, my voice is really going. That's it for this pan cast. I'm going to go take some NyQuil and crawl into bed. Assuming I survive, we'll see you next time on Uncle Scott's Pancast. <laughs> Ah! <laughs>